Hey friends, if you're on a GLP-1 medication such as Wagovi or Ozempic or Zepbound, or if you're thinking about going on one of them, you may be wondering, what is this medication doing for my brain? Is it having any other effects on my cognitive health or my mental health? We're going to dive right into this. So here we go. All right. As a reminder, this is educational information. It's not personalized medical advice. So what is a GLP-1 receptor agonist? You've probably heard of these medications before they're blockbusters. They mimic the GLP-1 hormone, which helps regulate blood sugar and appetite. It's used primarily for type 2 diabetes and weight management today. And some of the examples are Ozempic, Wagovi, and there's also something called Manjaro and Zepbound, which are GLP plus GIP. And in terms of the mechanisms of how they work, they actually do work in the brain. So they don't just work in your gut, they work in the brain as well. So in the hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain responsible for appetite, they do suppress appetite by increasing this, this neurobiological signal of satiety or fullness. And in the brain stem, a little bit farther down in the brain, there is an area called the nucleus tractus solitarius. Here, cravings for food and nausea are influenced by the GLP medications. The vagus nerve is a nerve that goes from your brain all the way down to the rest of your body and wanders its way throughout the body. This is responsible for the parasympathetic nervous system or the nervous system for resting and digesting. And GLP medications act on this nerve as well. They slow the gastric emptying, meaning the stomach emptying gets slowered. So food stays in the stomach longer and people feel fuller longer. And the medication enhances the gut and brain connection. So there's all these effects in the brain, which you may not have known about when you think about these medi medications for weight loss or for diabetes. Now, of course, we know that there's these metabolic effects in the pancreas, liver, gut, and in the fat tissue called adipose tissue. It's going to increase insulin that's secreted from the pancreas. It's going to suppress glucagon. In the liver, there's going to be less glucose production and there's going to be lower blood sugar because of that. In the stomach, as I mentioned, the gastric emptying is decreased or inhibited. So the food will stay in the stomach longer and people will feel less hunger and they're going to eat less. And in the fat cells themselves, because remember, fat is a metabolic organ. Fat is a hormonally and active organ. It's not just sitting there. It enhances lipolysis. The GLP-1 medications will enhance the breakdown of fat and fat metabolism. So they're affecting the brain as well as all over the body. This article is the one we're going to jump into here. It looked at the effect of GLP medications on cognitive and mental health disorders. So this is in nature mental health. So here's a big picture view of all of the things that GLP-1 medications do. Let's jump into this and break this down. First of all, in the endocrine and metabolic area, this is supposed to be a pancreas drawing. If you've ever seen a pancreas, it's a very mysterious organ. So what the GLP medications are doing here is they're decreasing the peripheral and neural insulin resistance. So oftentimes when we have weight gain, we get insulin resistance and we're decreasing that insulin resistance when you take this medication, meaning that the insulin receptor is getting more sensitive to the insulin and the insulin is not going to go as high in the bloodstream. Mitochondrial function and energy metabolism are also getting balanced, and we're not really sure what the GLP medications are doing for the stress hormones or the HPA axis, also known as the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Okay, what else is going on here? And the reason this is all really important is because in order to understand what's happening in the brain, you need to know what this medication is also doing in the rest of the body. So in terms of the immune system, there's a role for what's called glia. Now, microglia are cells in the brain that are related to the immune system. And there's a hypothesized role for microglia being affected by the GLP-1 medications. What we do know is that you see less of the blood-brain barrier leakage. So there's a barrier between your bloodstream and your brain to protect your brain, but also to help your brain function so that not everything in your blood bloodstream gets to your brain. We do know that there's a leak in this blood brain barrier that we see when people have obesity and that leak goes down. So that's good. And then peripheral inflammation and oxidative stress. This is a general problem of high inflammation. The visceral fat is in the gut is leaking inflammatory molecules and cytokines. And there's oxidative stress, which means there's just this general toxic biochemical environment. And we see that goes down with GLP medications. So that's good. So the immune system is getting stronger. What else? In the brain, there is a neuroprotective effect of GLP medications. So this one molecule called BDNF goes up, which is a very important molecule for creating new neurons, also known as neurogenesis. In addition, these molecules called amyloid and tau 
are related to dementia and Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So we see less amyloid and tau deposits with GLP-1 medication administration and less neuroinflammation. So that's really amazing. Whatever's happening to the heart is also probably happening to the brain. So all these things that are helping cardiovascular function are also helping all the plumbing and wiring of the brain. For neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is 5-HT and opioid, there's some hypothesized changes that are implicated, but it's not so definitive. Brain glucose metabolism and mitochondrial function are also improved. And we don't really know, but there is some effect on the neuropsychology, meaning the way we process rewards, the way emotions are affected by food and the way top-down executive functioning happens is probably affected by these medications as well. Now, the gut and brain are connected. And anytime you've had a exam in school and then you get butterflies in your stomach or you have a change in your bowel habits, you'll probably know that your brain and your gut are connected. So what we see is a greater satiety signal, a greater signal of I'm full right now coming from the hypothalamus and reward areas related to dopamine in the brain. So that's something that's pretty good. And probably there's some change in the microbiome, all the bacteria in the gut that are protecting the gut. Those have been observed as well. So now let's look at some of these studies, getting to the point of this video. So if you're taking one of these medications, what else is going on in your brain and in your body? So first, let's look at cognitive disorders. Here, we're thinking of things like dementias. So we break down the effect of this medication by studies, and there's different studies. So the worst type of evidence is a case series where you just have like someone, a researcher presenting a case and saying, hey, here's a case of somebody who took this medicine. This is what happened. That's pretty good initial evidence, but it's not really high quality evidence. Observational studies are like a snapshot. They're better than case series, but they don't really give you as much inference for causality, for what's causing what, because there's lots of confounding, meaning there's lots of other things that could be causing things. For example, I might do an observational study where I show that people who drink coffee also have more lung cancer. Oh my God, coffee is causing lung cancer. It could be that people who drink a lot of coffee smoke more and it's the cigarettes that are causing lung cancer. So. There's all these confounding variables. You can't really tell from an observational study. Lots of correlations. And correlation does not make causation. Now, above an observational study is a clinical trial. That's a, a higher level of evidence. And then above that is a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, which looks at a bunch of clinical trials, randomized controlled trials to see. So here we see a lot of good positive evidence for the benefit of GLP medications on cognitive disorders. A couple showing no effect and one showing negative effects. So the weight of evidence here looks like, hey, this is probably also improving cognition. This is probably also decreasing my chance of getting some kind of dementia. Now that's not definitive proof, but it's some level of evidence that's pretty good. So if you're taking one of these medicines, you can rest assured that probably it's doing something good for your cognition. What about alcohol and substance use disorders? The circuitry that is involved with obesity overlaps a lot with the circuitry in the brain involved with substance use disorders, alcohol and drug use disorders. Why? Because dopamine is involved in both of those. We know that when we eat food, we feel pleasure, we feel relief. And then when we especially have something that's hyper palatable or processed or high in sugar, there's often a spike in glucose and dopamine, then there's a crash, and then there's afterwards cravings, and then rumination, and how can I find that substance again? How can I get more of that? So that psychology overlaps a lot with food and substance use. And as I was describing that, you may have been saying to yourself, oh yeah, like that kind of feels the way I feel sometimes. You may be wondering, was he talking about food or was he talking about drugs? Were he talking about alcohol or nicotine or cigarettes? The point is, is the psychology often does overlap. That is probably why they're showing a positive effect here because those medications are maybe decreasing weight by decreasing the addictiveness of food decreasing the spikes in dopamine that people get after they eat high, high carbohydrate, high sugar foods. And in studies of GLP medications, when you look at what actually happens, people have less of cravings for these carbohydrate rich foods and processed foods. So it's almost like these medications get rid of food addiction, get rid of emotional eating. And so people are more able to match up their will with their behavior, their intention with their behavior. So if somebody's on one of these medicines and they're looking to lose weight and they also are struggling with something like alcohol use disorder or nicotine use disorder or something else, probably this is going to have a positive effect on that other disorder. And that's cool. In addition, psychotic disorders. Now, a psychotic disorder is something like schizophrenia or paranoia, hallucinations. The reason there's not much of an effect and not much of an overlap here is because circuitry in the brain that's involved with psychotic disorders doesn't overlap very much with what happens in obesity 
and eating disorders. So there's probably no reason to think that psychotic disorders are going to change very much when you're on a GLP-1 medication. Anxiety and mood disorders, there is some overlap, but it's a lot more complicated. So there's a huge higher risk of having depression, anxiety, and other mood and anxiety disorders when somebody has obesity, probably for a number of reasons. One, the obesity itself probably predisposes people to having depression and anxiety because of the ways that the biochemistry in the body changes with inflammation and other things. But also when somebody is depressed and anxious, they're more likely to gain weight because of the medications they're on, but also because of the way food is a way of self-soothing. And there's also this emotional eating that develops. But if you look at this graph, you'll see there's not, there's a lot of evidence of no effect, some evidence of negative effect over here, and a couple of studies showing positive effect. But overall, I would suggest if I had to guess, this is not going to be a huge effect from GLP-1 medication is probably not going to be used to treat depression and anxiety. Okay, and then eating disorders. There's a lot of overlap between eating disorders and obesity because there's emotional eating, there's nighttime eating, there's something called night eating syndrome, there's bulimia, which is basically binge eating disorder plus purging, and then there's binge eating disorder itself. There's all kinds of problems and components with eating behavior that contribute to obesity. And then even when somebody's having regular old weight gain, there's often a lot of components of stress eating emotional eating, using food as a coping strategy, as like emotional soothing, but also circadian rhythms being messed up when people are eating at night and, and so on. So I think there is some benefit for eating disorders. I think uh, some of these medications will be used for eating disorders, specifically binge eating disorder, because that's one where there's a huge overlap. I think if someone had binge eating disorder and that just doesn't, that doesn't mean you just eat a lot. You have, there's a technical definition of that. You have to look it up, but I think their binge eating disorder will be treated by GLP-1 medications. And I think bulimia will also eventually probably have a benefit from GLP medication use. The verdict is not in yet. This is just uh, the start of the research, but we have five good studies here on that. So why does this matter? If you're thinking of going on one of these medications, you need to have good informed consent. You need to know what they're actually doing in your body and in your life and all the other effects they're going to have for your other health conditions. So you want to be informed about that. What else could be a side effect? These other cognitive and mental health effects may be considered side effects, but they might also be considered main effects if those are problems that somebody's having. If you're already on one of these medications for weight or diabetes, you might want to talk to your clinician about what else it's doing already. You're already on this thing. What is it doing in my body? What is it doing in my brain? It may be also having other effects in your life that you want to talk about with your clinicians. And you may have one of these other uh, mental health conditions or cognitive conditions, and you may be interested in a GLP-1 medication to benefit you if you're not on it already. So that's something you want to talk about with your doctors. If you found this helpful, I really hope it's been beneficial. I really hope it's inspired you. Check out this other video of mine if you're interested, and also join my free newsletter to stay up to date and to not miss further updates. Thanks so much.